Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. You know, there's a lot of uh, contrasting words and themes and truths in the Bible. And and many times we kind of hold those things in balance. You you think about the, the reality and the truth and the beauty and the majesty of heaven. But then there's also the darkness and the horror of a bottomless pit called hell. You have both of those in the scripture. We know God is merciful and kind. And yet there are all kinds of examples of of judgment in the scripture. It wasn't that far into creation that that God finally said that he was, you know, uh, fed up with mankind. He sent this flood, destroyed every living thing except for those who are on the ark and the animals that, that he brought there. There was this, 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 there's this love, there's this judgment, there's, there's mercy, there's God's grace, but there's also God's wrath. You, you think about Jesus, I mean, here, here's a little innocent baby born in a manger, and, and the angels are singing, and the shepherds are going to see, and, and, and you know, wise men are bringing gifts. But then on the opposite end, you have a bloody cross, a, a, a spear going into his heart. You have Jesus crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so you have these, these contrasts of, of, and, and passages that, that speak of these things. In fact, in our passage today, Jesus tells a parable. And it's quite different than some of the other parables that he's told. Some of them are kind of peaceful and poetic, but this one, it's far from that. It's somewhat violent, it's somewhat forceful, it's somewhat dramatic. In this parable in Mark chapter 12, you you have the story of Israel as it's described as a vineyard, and those who keep the vineyard, and their relationship to God and His Son. Listen to what it says, and we'll just read part of it in chapter 12. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower, and he leased it to the tenants or the vine dressers, and he went into a far country. Now at vintage time, harvest time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers, that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. Well, they took him, the servant, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and him they threw stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another, and they killed him. And many others, beating some, killing some. And there's... For still having one son, his beloved, he sent him to them last, saying, they'll respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, hey, this is the heir. Let's kill him, and the inheritance, the, the whole vineyard will be ours. So they took him, and they killed him, and they cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come. And destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This this parable that, that Jesus tells is in response to a question that was asked him and he responds with this interesting, interesting story. Maybe you remember the last part of chapter 11 when they came to him, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. This is the, the, the top of the food chain of the religious leaders of Jerusalem. And they're asking him about, you know, all the things he's doing. He had cleansed the temple. He had done all these things. Well, who gives you the authority to do this? 
And Jesus said, well, let me ask you a question. And if you answer it, I'll, I'll tell you. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. They reasoned among themselves saying, I, get, I don't know if they got in a little huddle. You know, kind of like, we say this, this, what are we going to do? If we say from heaven, he'll say, well, why didn't you believe John? If we say from men, they feared the people for the, they counted John as a prophet. So they answered and said to Jesus, we plead the fifth. We can't answer because it would incriminate us. So they, so they give the French salute, so to speak. And, and, the, and then Jesus says, well, okay, if you're not going to answer me, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then in response, listen. To the death of John the Baptist, Jesus begins to talk about Israel and prophets. The owner of the vineyard would be God. The vineyard would be Israel itself, and, and the vine dressers would be these rulers of, of Israel, these priests and scribes and elders. And the servants that would come to Israel, sent by God, would be his prophets, including John the Baptist, who had just recently been beheaded. And the son, the heir, of course, would be Jesus Christ himself. Now, this story about these tenants and these vine dressers would be a familiar story with them because this was an actual practice in their day. And they'd be listening, and then they'd be real, realizing that Jesus was talking about them. The landowner makes an agreement with a vine dresser, with a tenant. They would care for the vineyard, benefit from the harvest, and pay the owner a percentage. So the owner trusts the tenant, and the tenant would trust the owner. A man would plant a vineyard, a hedge around it, and dig a vat and a tower, and he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. The, the contract would usually last at the beginning for about five years, so the vineyard would produce a profit. Give, the owner would give at least five years. And then he'd send a servant to examine the land, collect his percentage. And I, I would submit to you that, that God has always been patient with Israel. Very patient. Truly, God, the psalmist says, is good to Israel. The servants, well, they represent God sending his prophets again and again and again. In Hebrews chapter 1, you, you know that simple passage that talks about the, the prophets. We don't have it up there. It God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. So, so the Lord would send his prophets again and again to Israel. And Jesus tells his story, and here's what you would do with them. And, and instead of respecting them, instead of hearing them, instead of giving them, you would kill them or stone them or treat them in a way. And, and I'll, I'll read this passage to you. It's, it's in the, the book of um, Hebrews when it talks about, you know, the, the, the prophets, how, how they treated them over and over again in chapter 11. It, it speaks of this terrible thing. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, speaking of the... the uh, prophets. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains. All these things haven't obtained a good testimony. They, 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 were, they were over and over again put to death. And God still was patient with Israel. And, and here in this, this parable, Jesus is exposing the, the, the true heart and the mindset of the people of Israel, especially the religious leaders. Now, now listen to verse 6. After you've killed the prophets, you, you sent them away, therefore still having one son, his beloved, he sent him and saying, at last they, they will respect my son. 
And, and the, the verbiage here, I think Jesus is using uh, intentionally. It, it's similar to the voice of his baptism that came out of heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It's very similar to the voice that came from heaven at the transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And Jesus in this parable is, is confronting these religious leaders with the spiritual state of Israel and the fact that they've rejected God's voice over and over again. And this kindness, this patience, this hope that God has had for Israel, he, he's reached out to them over and over and given them uh, this, this, this amazing sense of his grace and mercy and his word. Verse 6 speaks of his faithful love. Finally, after all you did, I still sent you my son. And then we have these verses, but those vine dressers said among themselves when the son came, well, this is the heir. Let's kill him. And the inheritance is ours. Now, they know that Jesus is talking to them about himself. And they killed him, if you know the whole story of, of the New Testament, out of envy, out of jealousy. All the other things were, were, were blasphemy and all of that was just trumped up by these men. And, and here's the truth, and, and I think we all know this. Ourselves, if not careful, and people can be very covetous and very greedy. They want what is not theirs or what they should not have. It's like Adam and Eve. You can have everything in the garden to eat, but there's just one thing you can't touch and, and leave it alone. Well, that's the very thing they wanted. And our desires can rule our lives. It, our selfish ambition instead of what God has for us. So they, they throw the sun out, it says, of the vineyards. A picture of Jesus being crucified, if you will, outside the city gates. Someone said it like this, and this is probably about as simply as you can put it. God in his grace and his love sent his only son to the earth. And what did we do? We killed him. We killed him. Spurgeon, known as the prince of preachers, said it like this. If you reject Jesus, well, he, he answers with tears. He, he came to Jerusalem on that final week, and it tells us in the Gospels that he, that he wept over Jerusalem, said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you like a mother hen gathers its chicks, but you would not. Spurgeon said, if you wound him, Jesus bleeds cleansing blood for you. If you kill him, he dies as a sacrifice to redeem you. If you bury him, he rises again to bring you new life. This is Jesus, born an infant, sharing our weakness. I, I don't think there's anything more, you know, fragile and weak than a little baby. You know, my wife and I just had our 14th grandchild this week. We now have seven girls and seven boys. And Christmas is right around the corner. <laughs> so we're going to take a special offering right now. No, no. <laughs> But yeah, it's like Jesus became a baby, God in the flesh. I mean, it can't get any weaker than that. And he was a carpenter, toiled with his hands and labored with his back. And he was rejected. He shares our weakness. He, he, he shares our labor. He, he shares our loneliness. So Jesus was, was not even received by his own. He came to his own and his own received him not. You ever felt that way? And he tells a story, Jesus is drawing it from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, as he's, as he's talking about this, this, this vineyard. He, he, it's almost word for word sometimes. In Isaiah chapter 5, 5, it says, Now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. This is a prophecy by Isaiah speaking of Israel. I'll take away its hedge. It shall be burned and break down its walls. It will be trampled down. 
I, I will lay it to waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord, the host is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. And he looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, a cry of help. And Jesus will die in that city. In 70 AD, the Romans will burn it to the ground. And Jesus will open the gates to the Gentiles. You and I have been called as part of the stewards of his vineyard now. We're called to produce fruit for him, and, and we're called also to give back to him that which he's given to us as part of the body, as part of his kingdom. Jesus gives this picture in this parable as he's, as he's talking about this vineyard. And, and, and then he, he kind of switches gears at the very end. He says, the stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief in verse 10, the chief cornerstone. It's the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Now, this, this picture is an indictment to them. The cornerstone is the most important stone. The, the whole structure gives stability and symmetry by the cornerstone. And, and the, the capstone on a, on a column or the keystone in an arch or a cornerstone of a foundation. And Jesus says, you, you, you've wrecked the whole thing. The, the, the cornerstone, the very, the very most important thing that God has sent you, you've rejected it. A Caesar, a Roman Caesar of that day, would, and Rome was known for all its beautiful arches. And when he hired someone to build one of those arches, Caesar would make the builder stand under the creation, under this massive arch, while the keystone or the cornerstone was put in place. And if the arch stood, great, amazing. But if it collapsed, well, the builder died under the crush of the arch. You make sure the arch is done pretty well, wouldn't you, if you were building that one and had to you know I'm going to be standing under that thing when that final stone goes in. In some ways, Jesus is describing how all history and all mankind is held together by him. The message of, of Scripture is incomplete without God sending his only son. All that's been prophesied, all that's been pictured, all the types that were there, that none of them make sense unless the cornerstone is put in place. None of them fit together without Jesus. No one can save and no one can cleanse but Jesus. No animal sacrifice will, will, will take his place. No, no rituals, no dietary laws. Heaven has no other message. The Bible has no other hero or capstone or cornerstone than Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Nothing else makes sense without him. To reject Christ is to reject hope, it's to reject heaven, and it's to reject God. There's no other gospel, there's no other Savior, there's no other sacrifice for sin. And Jesus comes onto the scene and says, you've murdered the prophets. You've turned away from God. You've, you've, you, you, you've gone after your own lust and greed. You, you, you saw that you wanted the, the popularity of the people. And so now his son comes to you and you reject him. And the leaders, well, look what they do. They, they sought to lay hands on him. They wanted to pray for him. No, that, that's not what they're saying. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to capture him, and they wanted to arrest him. They wanted to put him to death, as they eventually did. They sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. They knew exactly what Jesus had said, and the crowd standing there going, man, Jesus is unloading on these guys. So they, they left him, and they, they went away, the scribes and the elders and the priests, And they decide to broaden the net, if you will, a little bit, to expand their group to include the Pharisees and the Herodians. Uh, look what it says. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees, verse 13, and Herodians 
to catch him in his words. They, they had a powwow. They said, look, you know, we, we've got the Pharisees who are the extreme right religious. They, they, they are opposed to Rome and Caesar because Caesar claims to be a god. And, and they totally oppose everything the Romans stand for. And then there's the Herodians that are on the far left who identify with the king, Herod, and, and they're more involved in politics than they are religion. They'll put their political interest above their religious interest, and the Pharisees and the Herodians hated each other. But the chief priests and the scribes and the elders were able to bring them together, even though they were enemies, to come against a common enemy, which was Jesus Christ. They're both Jews, the Herodians. They're both understand who the one true God is. So they convince them to, to work together against this common person, this common problem called Jesus. And here's the issue. They tell them Jesus is going to create problems with our religion, which the Pharisees would be against. And he's going to create problems for us with the Romans, which the Herodians would be against. So, so they, they send them together to try and trap Jesus with either a rejection of the Jewish faith or the rejection of the Roman rule. And so here's what happens. They, they said to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him. When they'd come, they said to him, teacher, and they really butter Jesus up, and they give him all this flattery and all these words. We, we, we know you are true. They don't believe that. Ever had anybody do that to you? Just flatter you, and at the same time, you know, okay, what is this guy really up to? Teacher, we know you are true, and you care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men. In other words, you don't discriminate with anybody. You love the lepers. You love the, you know, anybody. You teach the way of God in truth. So is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? There's their question. And that there's, no, there's no good answer. If he says yes, pay, then that's blasphemy to the Pharisees because on the very coinage that Caesar has made it is inscripted that he is God. If he says no, then the political group of Romans will be going nuts because now he's an insurgent. Now he's involved in anarchy and rebelling. And, and Rome, listen, Rome has no tolerance for those who come against the Caesar. It's not like, well, you have a right to an attorney. Uh, we're going to put you in, you know, no, you, 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 get, you get nailed to a cross. There's no trial for a guy like that who comes against Rome. will kill you. Blasphemy is a serious offense. If he says no to those Herodians, they'll form a Roman uh, official. Jesus, it says in verse 15, he knows they're hypocrites. Shall we pay or shall we not pay, they say. But he knowing, verse 15, their hypocrisy. So why do you test me? You know, it'd be like someone coming up to you with that age-old question, do you still beat your wife? Yes or no? There's no good answer to that. No, she beats me. That's what you say usually. It's an unfair question. They've asked Jesus for a yes or no or an answer, and I'm sure everyone is listening. Okay, what's he going to say? Because there's the religious people there on the far right, there's the far left, and they're all dialed in. Well, whose side's he on? And Jesus gives one of the most profound answers that has had huge impact on Christi Christianity and government even to this day. You'll hear this quoted. And Jesus answered and said to them, uh, but so, so they brought, he said, hey, hey uh, bring me a denarius that I may see it. This is a coin about a day's wage for a, a, a common laborer. And it has a picture of Caesar on it, an inscription that he's God. 
and it's used for a tax. It's used for a poll tax, which we would probably call a census tax. It's not something for a toll road. It's not something for produce or anything that you would be selling. It, it's a tax on you because you exist. You have to pay this tax. It's a census tax. And so Jesus has a coin. Someone brings it to him. Whose image is on this? And they said, Caesar's. And, and I'm sure it got real quiet. And Jesus answered and said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Oh my gosh, he slipped out of that. Wow. I mean, imagine how long they worked on this, this question and waiting for his response. And Jesus, in that one statement, legitimizes not only human government, but also the Lord. He, he, you know, God, God has legitimized family and church and government. The government levies taxes and, and, and makes laws. And, and Romans chapter uh, 13, it tells us, you know, that we're supposed to obey uh, the, the laws of the, of the land. And let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God and authorities that exist are appointed by God. And all three through Old Testament, New Testament scripture, we, we understand that that's a principle of scripture. First Timothy chapter two, one through two. Therefore, exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So Jesus says, render unto Caesar the authority that's over you, what's due him, but also give to God what belongs to God. Well, the, the coinage bears the image of Caesar, you and I bear the image of God. You and I were made in this image. We're to give ourselves to God and to obey the, the, the government and the authority. And, and, and less, well, unless there comes a place where government prohibits me from doing what the Bible commands or when it commands me to do what the Bible prohibits. And then there's a place for civil disobedience. Jesus, while he lived under the Roman Empire, brought the gospel of the kingdom, not as a rebel, not as a zealot. And he'll die because of the envy and the hatred of the religious leaders. But he really dies because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We needed a savior. You know, I've had the privilege to travel to a lot of different countries. I love America. When I contrast it to some of the other places I've been, I, I love America. I'm not sure I love where America's headed. It's kind of scary to me. That the whole COVID thing freaked me out. Did that thing freak you out? <laughs> the whole world suddenly held captive by this, this, this crazy virus. And all the conspiracy theories and all trying to figure out what's true, what's not true. Shut down the churches, but leave the bars and the abortion clinics open. It's like, really? Is that what we're supposed to do? And the government just kind of swooping in and, 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 you know, sort of enforcing all these different things. And if you would travel to different cities in America, each had their own twist and their own uh, uh, kind of response based on their, their governors and based on the authorities that lived in those states even to this day. And, and we begin to hear this, 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 this term called fake news. Anybody hear that term used anywhere? And now you're still stepping back going, well, what the heck is going on? And America, I mean, it, America is, is in deep trouble. We, we started a school about four or five years ago and, and went from, you know, a small three-year-olds and, and VPK to, to now we're going like this. No, we can't take any more students. We're up to fifth grade. We've got three modulars out there that we're cramming kids in. And it's because the 
culture and the, and the world that we're living in has gone so woke and so liberal that no one wants to put their kids in there in the public school for, for good reason. And, and you know, some do, that's fine. But many are saying, I don't want that to fight that battle. You've got to choose which battle you want to fight. And I don't even want to go to the, the presidential debates and that kind of stuff. I don't want those emails. <laughs> but th that's a whole other scenario, what's going on right there. And then there's the Biden world. Oh my gosh. <laughs> there's, his <laughs> there's his son, there's Joe. I mean, there's, there's like, it's just like, how did we get here? Where's Abraham Lincoln? I mean, I believe that America was founded on strong biblical principles. It was. You can, you can check the history. But not that long ago, we threw God out of the schools and out of the government. And, and now we have massive teenage suicide and gender issues. And it's just like, wow. But I love America. It's my country. But, but I will say this, that... Um, My true independence is not marked by a flag or a war with the British. Now, I was in a conference just last week, and we had a British guy there from the UK, a Calvary Chapel guy. You know, he's, he speaks with that accent that you have when, you, when you're from, New e from England. And he got up there and he said, um, I'm from the UK. He says, I want you to know, we've forgiven you. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute, we beat you. What are you talking about? You forgive us. But, but you know, my independence is not a flag or a war, but a cross and an empty tomb. That's where my true independence comes from. And that's my first priority. In Jesus, you are free. You're free from shame and guilt and your past and your sin. You're free from the penalty of sin. You, you read the Bible and, and it says, yes, you are to pray for those in authority. Yes, you are to obey the laws. I mean, and that's getting harder and harder in some situations. I mean, uh, I, I live out here east, a little east of Gulf Breeze. And uh, there's speed limits. There's traffic. And um, there's the eternal trash cans or whatever you call those things along the road and everything changes all the time. You don't know where you turn and you're trying to get into these lanes and people are, it's, it's bizarre out there. They can't even figure that out. My, my, I don't want to go down the traffic thing. I'm not going to talk. <laughs> I, I could really go off on that. That's, that's like old guys talking, so I don't want to. My wife was say, shut up. You sound like an old grouch. I go, Kind of am. <laughs> but Jesus, you know, when Jesus came, he kept the laws. He didn't break them. But he, but he manifest God's truth and his, his uh, identity in a powerful way. From the very beginning, we, we've read this over and over from Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 15, where Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come. It's at hand. It's here. And then he began to demonstrate it in the most powerful ways. I mean, astonished people with his teaching. He, he healed people like lepers and people who been born blind. He, he, he gave uh, strength to the paralytic's legs. He, he, he healed withered hands. He, he walked on water. He calmed storms. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. And, and there'd be, it's the undeniable you know, scenario of the kingdom of God has come and that he is the chosen one. He is the Christ. And now the question's being answered, not who, but how are you going to be the Messiah? He's going to lay down his life. He's done all he can do to prove who he is. And now he's beginning to show how he's going to do it. And even the disciples are confused up to the very last night. He's going to go to a cross. An innocent, spotless lamb to take away the sin of the world. You know, I'll be a good citizen. I'll live in subjection to government authority. I mean, think, think about the Christians in, in times of Jesus. It was a very pagan 
Think about people like Joseph in Egypt. Joseph was second in command of the most pagan nation of that time. I mean, they were killing the Hebrew slaves' firstborn male children. Joseph was right there where God had placed him in a place of authority and was able to bring them in during the times of famine and difficulty. Had he abducted from that responsibility, he, it would have been God put him there. Daniel in Babylon. And Jesus himself. Obey the state, but worship only God. Be true to him. Scripture says all authority is established by and comes from God. But I do think there is a place and can come a place for civil disobedience when the government prohibits us from doing what the Bible commands and when it commands me to do what the Bible prohibits. Even the apostles would say, shall we please you or please God? They told them, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. They went back and prayed. And, and, and you, know what they, you know what they prayed for? God, don't wipe out the government. Not, not, they said, God, give us boldness that we might speak. That's what they prayed for. I think some of us, maybe all of us, need to pray that prayer. God, give us boldness to speak up for who we are and what's been done in our lives through Jesus Christ. And so, but the big question comes down to, uh, do you know for sure who Jesus Christ is in your life? Not a religious figure, not just a prophet. Do, do you know for sure you have salvation in his name? It's not about confirmation or baptism or church membership, but have you believed and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? So that's the big question. You know, one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. And one of the things I, I hope we're known for here at Calvary Chapel is to help people know for sure that they're saved. Or if you've walked away from the Lord, to give an opportunity to come back. Jesus tells that wonderful story about the prodigal son who took all that God had given him and just wasted it and ended up at the bottom of the rung, feeding swine. And he said, you know, even my father's hired servants have it better than this. I'll just go back to him. I'll just tell him I'll work for him as a hired servant. And a wonderful picture and story in that prodigal son story is that he would not have it. The father said, no, 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 I've got a robe, I've got a ring, I've got sandals, we're going to have a party. My son, who once was dead, is now alive. He welcomes the prodigal back with huge open arms. Isn't that awesome that God's like that? So the question would be, as we wind this down, do you know for sure? Are you one that needs to make a fresh commitment in your faith? Do you, do, do, are you in the vineyard, let's say, producing fruit and giving back to the Lord? Are you a stumbling block to others? Everyone Jesus calls, he calls publicly. Everyone Jesus calls, he calls to be salt and light. I think about Matthew at the tax table. He was a hated Jew in his own community. Even his own parents rejected him. And Jesus comes walking along. He's in the tax booth there in Capernaum area. Jesus walks up to him and goes, he only says two words to Matt. Follow me. And Matthew says, well, when it's dark and no one's around... I'll come follow you. So no one knows. I'll take some tax money with me. Oh, no, it's right in the broad daylight. She says, if you want to follow me, and everyone Jesus called, he called publicly. And he said, if you're ashamed of me, he said, I'll be ashamed of you when I come with my, my, all my angels before the Father, I'll be ashamed of you. Let, let me just say this. Jesus is no one to be ashamed of. He, he's, he's, he's the greatest gift God's ever given to us. And if you're a prodigal, he's saying to you, come home. I'm standing waiting for you. And if you don't know for sure, he says, what would it profit you if you gained the whole world and lost your own soul? And no one knows what tomorrow holds. 
Jesus has proven without a doubt who he is. No one can do the things you do lest you be from God. And he's proven how he's our Savior by dying on a cross for our sins, a sinless sacrifice that was pictured all through the Scriptures. And none of it makes sense without his sacrifice on the cross. And he would say to you, he would say to me, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And I would submit to you, you find no rest for your soul or for your heart until you come to him. And what a wonderful Savior he is. And as you begin to follow him and as you begin to trust him and as you, he, he takes you from this, this, this beginning place and, and before you know it, he, he starts putting you in the vineyard and you're, 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 you're working there for him and, and you're producing fruit and he comes and, 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 and hopefully you don't turn away from him and become arrogant and proud of what you've done. You continue to produce fruit in his vineyard and you give back to him that which he's given to you. It all belongs to him anyway.